Okay, so welcome to Birmingham Law School's latest Leaders in Law lecture. I'm Paul McConnell, the Law School's Head of Careers and Employability, and I'll be hosting this event. Tonight, we're delighted to be joined by Yutunde Dania, the Head of Office of International Law Firm Charon Hamlin's Birmingham office. Um, just to give a bit of background, first of all, about the Leaders in Law lectures. These are lectures that run through Birmingham Law School's Centre for Professional Legal Education and Research, or Kepler for short. As this is an open public lecture, I should explain that, that Kepler is unique amongst UK university law schools. It's a centre that sits alongside the academic provision of the law school to provide our students with the knowledge, experiences and skills that they will need for a future successful professional career, whether as a lawyer or in another profession. Leaders in Law is very much a central part of the Kepler programme every year. Every year we have two or three Leaders in Law lectures where we invite inspirational and distinguished members of the legal profession to speak to our students and guests from around the community. I have to admit at this stage that it was actually me that came up with the idea of inviting Yutunde to come and speak to us today because I could think of no better leader in law to inspire our students. First of all, thinking about Yutunde's own career path, she qualified as a solicitor in 1996 and very quickly ascended to partner by 2005. Following that, she joined Trowers and Hamlins in 2011, and in January last year, she was appointed as head of the Birmingham office of Trowers and Hamlins. So a fantastic career trajectory, which has been recognised through a number of awards, in particular the Birmingham Black Lawyers Award for Lawyer of the Year in 2019. And Yatunde was also shortlisted as Partner of the Year in the Birmingham Law Society Awards 2000, 2018. Now I actually remember alongside Yatunde's professional accomplishments um, encountering Yatunde for the first time not quite 20 years ago but not far off it when we were both um, involved in supporting and mentoring students who were aspiring to enter the legal profession. And for me, one thing that really stands out is not just Yutunde's career success, but also her really strong commitment to supporting and inspiring future members of the legal profession, and in particular to championing, championing diversity. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that in what Yutunde has to say this evening. In terms of the format of the presentation, we'll hear now from Yutunde but at the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity to ask all of your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, if you can save your questions for the last few minutes of the presentation. But now, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Yutunde. Well, thank you very, very much. And I'm just so privileged to have been invited to deliver this lecture to the University of Birmingham. So thank you very much. Um, and also thank you very much for your kind words. I sat here listening to those words, pinching myself. And the reason that I was pinching myself is because to me, I'm just Yutunde Dania. I will share with you um, my background, my career journey. I will share with you um, my, a bit about my life at Trowers. Um, and then I'll share with you my leadership position as head of our Birmingham office um, at a time when it was difficult for a number of reasons, uh, not just because of COVID. Um, so who is this? woman sitting before you. I was born a long time ago. Um, I was born to Nigerian parents. I was actually born in London and my mum and dad weren't married. Um, my dad, after arriving in the UK, decided to go back to Nigeria. My mum saw, saw it as an opportunity to improve her life and she decided to stay. What my mum decided to do was work and work hard and her work ethic is something that I admire to this day. 
However, because of the way in which she worked, she knew that she couldn't look after me in the way that she would like to. And so she decided to place me with foster parents. And back in those days, it was quite common for Nigerian parents to put their children um, in foster care. Um, there's a film out there called Farming. If you, if you watch that, it's a really riveting account. And when I watched it, I related to so much of that film about being placed into foster care. My foster parents were white. My foster parents had fostered for Bernardo's all of their lives. My foster mum was 60 when she took me in and I was just one years old. So there I am in, I, I initially went to live with her in Kent and her husband and her twin brother and her twin brother had learning difficulties. And soon after um, I went to Kent, we moved to the very diverse place called Great Yarmouth. And that's where I grew up. That's, that's my home. That's what I call home. Um, and I was still in touch with my natural parents. And um, I think the intention was to take me back and possibly send me to Nigeria for my secondary education. But my foster mom, she was one in a million. She was amazing. She saw that all children needed was love. And so being a black child in Great Yarmouth wasn't an issue. My foster mum instilled in me that I deserved to be the very best that I could be and that I could be absolutely anything I could be. My natural parents, Nigerian parents, are very focused upon education. And so, um, you know, they were very um, for the professions. Um, when I was going through school, my grades weren't fantastic, if I'm honest. I had various things happen at various times. So my foster dad passed away when I was about to do my A-level. So my A-level grades weren't fantastic. Um, but I saw a photograph and it was a photograph of a cousin in Nigeria. And she had on her robes and she had on her wig. And I was like, wow, she looks amazing. I want to be that. And so I did a little bit of um, research and I found out that she was a solicitor and I decided that that's what I wanted to be. Now, bearing in mind that there was just, there was just one of me and there was some mixed, mixed race twins, dual heritage twins in uh, my school. It was just the three of us. And so I go bounding up to my, my teacher and tell them, told them that I wanted to be um, a solicitor. And in those days, I don't know if it still happens, but there was this computer program and you put in all your, your, the things that you liked and what have you. And I got out a card saying prison warden, prison warden. And I was, I want to be in law, yes, but there's no way that I want to be a prison warden. So I set my heart on being a solicitor. My teachers told me, look for something else because you're likely to be disappointed. I'm an Aries girl um, and I'm a true Aries. Um, leadership and determination are in my DNA. And so I think, I look back on those days and I think actually those teachers did the best thing for me by telling me that I couldn't. Because the fact that they told me that I couldn't told me that I was going to show them that I could. And no person is an island. Um, I've met some fantastic teachers and lecturers during my career. And believe it or not, I'm in touch with those ones that helped me until this day because I'm totally in, in total gratitude to them. So it was my sociology teacher um, when my A-level grades weren't great. And I said, Dave, look, I really want to be a solicitor. And he was like, well, you're not going to get into university with those grades, but let's look at something that you can do that will set you on your way. And I ended up doing a HND in business and finance in a place called Farnborough. Um, that was a really interesting time up until the age of 18, 19, I'd lived with my white foster parents in my white area of Great Yarmouth. 
and I, you know, arrived at this property and the, the, the college had found me digs and it was with a black couple. It, it was just fascinating because I was like, wow, this is the first time I'm going to get this opportunity to live with black people. Anyway, during my time at Farnborough, I met an amazing woman and I did some law on the side, sort of did A-level law. But again, she took a real interest in me. That worked out really well. And I um, got my grades to go to what was then known as Leicester Polytechnic, it's now De Montfort University. That was a fantastic opportunity. And I said, the fact that I was there, I was gonna make the very best of it. Um, and I think it was probably then where my mentoring started. There were so few black people doing law at that time, um, the, the um, uh, law degree at that time that we kind of, formed a study class and that kind of each one teach one if you've heard of that phrase before you know I'm going to go to this lecture okay I'm going to help you when when you come to those tricky tricky parts on on the course um, so I had a great experience at Leicester um, again I gravitated towards the African Caribbean society I mean I, I had a good time at uni I, I really did have a good time at, at university sometimes I think perhaps a bit of a too good a time. Um, I came out with a 2-2, two -two. Um, just missed a 2-1. I challenged it, but it, it was a 2-2. Two -two. So it was a case of, okay, I, at that time, and I'm not giving away my age, but at that time, there was something called the Law, uh, the Law Society Finals. And it was the last year of the Law Society Finals. And I didn't get on, I didn't get on them. I didn't get on. And I was really disappointed. Um, but I decided that I didn't want to work because I didn't want to start earning money. And then it would be, I felt it would be more difficult for me to go back to do the LPC. So I decided to make the time count. And I uh, did a master's in human rights and civil liberties. And I worked part-time and I worked part-time as a cleaner. And I have the greatest respect for cleaners. And the reason for that is I, I work for a company, I don't know if it even exists anymore. It's called Mattel Toys. And I was invisible um, to everybody. I was just the cleaner. And when I tried to talk to people and say, look, I'm at university doing my master's and I want to be a lawyer, I was kind of scoffed at. So to this day, I have the utmost respect for cleaners. I see them because you don't know what they're doing. You don't know what they're going through. So I always see the cleaners that, uh, that work in, in my firm. Um, so I did my um, master's. Um, it, human rights and civil liberties is something that I'm extremely passionate about, and and you'll see you'll 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 get to learn that through my um, through my lecture. Um, so that resonated with me. I thought if I'm going to do a master's, I may as well do something that I'm really passionate about. And again, I met a fantastic fantastic lecturer who was a great support, um, and I passed my master's. And then I, it was the first, very first year of the LPC. And by this time, Leicester Polytechnic was De Montfort University. And I applied and I was successful. Um, and I have to say that my, my natural parents, uh, as much as I haven't been brought up with them, I have spent a lot of time with them and they were committed to my education. And so I was fortunate enough to um, for them to sponsor me through that time because a lot of these additional qualifications that I took we had to pay for so I did the LPC first year I think at that time it was what about five thousand six thousand pounds um, it's eye-watering how much it is today I did the LPC and I'm like brilliant time to get a training contract um, I don't think I was really ready for that 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 moment of hold on a moment, we don't want you. Um, it was pure rejection. The system was different to the way in which it is now, but it was lever arch stuff. Um, yeah, it, you know, uh, rejection by compliment slip by one, one firm of solicitors that has now gone bust. Um, um, so, you know, the name Yutunde, it had been changed throughout, you know, my time because people couldn't pronounce it 
Um, and so I spent a lot of my life, believe it or not, and do never call me this. If you contact me on LinkedIn, do not call me this because I won't reply. So for a lot of time, I was called Yeti. Um, and Yeti in Nigeria, the Yutunze means my grandpa, my grandmother reborn in me. And that's because I was the first child after my grandmother passed away. So in Nigeria, a lot of people reduce it to Yeti and there is no kind of um, derogatory connotations to it, but that's completely different over here. So I think by the time I'd gone to uni, I decided that I was going to go back to my full name, um, which was fine. But then I was applying to places and I was thinking, gosh, they're going to know that I'm black. The name you can say, they're not going to be able to pronounce it. So I decided to use the name Tina for a while to see if Tina could get me through the door at least. And then I could get through the door and hopefully my talent would shine through. It didn't work, to be honest. Um, I ended up working at BT, taking 999 calls and emergency calls and, and that kind of thing. And I did that for about six months. And then a job came up at a legal aid firm in Birmingham called McGrath & Co. And at that time, McGrath & Co. is like legal aid, rights on, human rights for the underdog. Right on, I've got this. Um, so I applied for a paralegal job, actually, and they took an absolute age to respond. Um, and um, eventually they took me on with another girl. They said the issue had been that they would wanted to take two people on. Um, and after a year, they offered me a training contract. At that time, um, you could have a year taken into account. Um, so I qualified then in 1996. My, the work that I did was housing, housing litigation. It wasn't an area that I thought about, but it was fine because it was right, right, right on. Um, it was about, you know, defending people who, um, where their landlord was seeking to take possessions, possession of their home or where people were living in terrible conditions. It was about getting them compensation. So it resonated with me. It, you know, it, it spoke to my passion, it scratched my itch. Um, there was then a split in the firm and I wanted to go with the people that were going. I think at that time I was an NQ on either 13 or 14,000 pounds, a huge amount at that time. And they couldn't afford to take me with, with them. So I stayed for a bit and then I decided that for me, I wanted to make more of my life. I, there was just something I wanted to make more. Um, and so I decided to jump ship. So instead of representing tenants, I thought I could scratch my itch representing um, landlords. Um, one of the things that I haven't mentioned is that the day that I qualified was one of those amazing moments where, you know, I kind of, excuse this, but I kind of stuck my middle finger up to the people that told me that I couldn't do it. And it was one of those feelings where I kind of qualified and I went, oh, is this, is this what they told me that I couldn't do? Is, is this it? Um, so, you know, and I'll come back to that time and time again. Then I started representing landlords and I went to another firm in the city. Um, at that time, my life was a bit up and down, um, relationship breakdown and that kind of thing. And I decided that I go to this firm because of their what they were based based about what they their ethics and, and what have you were unfortunately I was covering a maternity leave and that firm didn't resonate to me for me they they said that they were all one way but the actual experience in the firm was a different way and again I'll come back to that you know that authenticity um, in a moment so I worked there for a year and then I joined another firm. And to be honest, I joined that firm in 2001. And believe it or not, even though I'm at a different firm and have been at a number of firms since, I'm still at that firm. So it was a, a small firm called Lee Crowder. It merged with a firm called Cobbitz. Cobbitz went bust. I managed to leave just before it went bust and I joined Shoesmiths. But I am grateful to Lee Crowder and Cobbitz because it was in 2003 that I made um, senior associate. And it was in 2005 at Cobbitz that I made partner. And that was another moment where I kind of went, hold on, let me pinch myself. I'm a partner, but hold on a moment. They told me that I couldn't be a solicitor. So what are they going to say when I'm a partner? And so I kind of, you know, I thought about their what were the reasons that they'd maybe partner? And believe it or not, one partner said it wasn't because I was black. 
And I thought, well, it is because I'm black, I'm sure. At that time, we were in that whole tick box era. But I said, okay, well, whatever reason you've made me a partner, I'm going to use this platform to try and drive change, to try and inspire the next generation. And to be honest, for me, it's almost not about the law anymore. It's about trying to encourage people to see that they can do exactly what I've done. Um, I'm special, yes, but I'm nothing particularly special. Um, so I was at Shoesmith for a while. That was, that was great, really great experience. And then I was getting a little bit frustrated in my team for various reasons that I won't talk about now. And I'd actually come home and I'd said to, you know, my strong foundation, which I encourage you all to have, the, the people that you can really talk openly to. And I said to that person, look, I've had enough. I can't defend this person and the behaviors aren't right and it doesn't resonate with me. I'm gonna hand my notice in. And it must've been about a week later, I was stalling with writing my resignation letter. And it was about a week later when I, that I heard that Trowers were coming to Birmingham. And I recall being at a previous firm and somebody going off to Trowers. And you know, when you're like waving them off and going, I'm so jealous. Um, and I'd said all along, Travers have got a right hole in their business. You know, they've got offices in Manchester, London and Exeter. Why aren't they in the Midlands? So Travers came knocking and I thought, no, they're not going to want me. And I had a conversation and they did want me. I, I remember going for the interview and they wanted me and various things changed, which resulted in me. I'd been a partner for six years, but it resulted in me heading up my team and my team comprised of it comprises of somebody I've worked with for 20 years, another person I've worked with for 17 years. So I'm a keeper of people. I, I literally am. Um, and so my confidence had been completely knocked by that time. And I was very nervous. And I was, how am I going to talk to the people that the partner had told me that people aren't going to want to listen to you? That, that was the kind of era that I was in. It was you know, you can't go to the meetings because they're not going to want to see you. Um, they're going to want to see this person because that person, you, anyway, I won't go into it, but there was, there was a lot of, I'm all right to do the work and the legwork, but I'm not the one who should be presented to the clients. And so all of a sudden I'm in a position where I've got to go out and talk to the clients. And so I decided the only thing that I'm really, 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 really good at is being myself. This is, this is it. This is authentic, Yutunde. And so I decided that I was going on a journey of authenticity. And what you see is what you get. And I think my clients actually value that authenticity. So to me, a solicitor is not about trying to replicate somebody who's been on suits or what you think it should be. It should be who you are, your authentic self. Um, and I think to grow we need to be in environments where we can be our authentic selves. We can be our true selves. Um, and that's what I try to offer as a leader. And I would say that I must be successful at it because of, you know, my two colleagues that have been with me into double digit years. Um, so my time at Trowers. So I, I've just had my head down, just had my head down and I've been learning and watching and getting involved and, using this platform, using this platform to inspire. So I mentor, I mentor anybody that will ask me, don't all ask at once, um, but I, I love mentoring people, whether I can do that one-on-one, -on -one, whether I can do it a, a, from afar, like a lecture like this, um, whether it's writing articles, um, that's always been my passion, as I've said. And Trowers is an environment where it's encouraged me to use that platform. Um, it's a firm that appreciates difference and embraces diversity. Um, and that can be quite scary when you, when you think, oh my gosh, somebody actually, they don't, they don't just see me, they actually see me and appreciate what I've got to say about diverse issues. So I recall being asked to give a talk during Black History Month. Um, and that was one of those moments when I was just like, oh my gosh, my employer has asked me to 
talk about something so personal. I mean, what am I going to say? I can't, I can't give this talk to the entire, it was a firm wide uh, talk. I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that if I don't talk about slavery. And if I don't, if I talk about slavery, I'm going to offend people. It was a real different time. It was a real, it was a real kind of like ball in my stomach, but I delivered it. And it was, it was beautiful because people appreciated what I was sharing. They wanted to know about experience and you would have heard a lot about experience over the last um, 12 months. So you can imagine my surprise when I'm approached and asked whether I would be interested in being head of office. And I was, you know, when you look to your left, look to your right, are you talking to me? And I think it's about leadership. It's, it's about my leadership style. And this is something that, you know, it, it's really interesting. You'll start as a solicitor, you'll want to go to promote that partnership. You'll be responsible for a, t a team, but nobody's taught you. You've, you've never been sent on any management um, management courses. Um, I, I think leadership is is quite simple, to be honest. It's treating people how you would like to be treated. It's respecting people, um, and respect is something that we can all do. And I think it's something that the world needs a bit more of. But we can all do that. And I think it's an interest in people. I, I totally love people. As I've said, I collect people. So I started mentoring somebody in 2001. Um, I have since been to her wedding. I've since carried her baby. Um, we are now talking 20 years later. I'm still in touch with that person. Um, so I am, you know, people leave my team and I will still be in touch with them. And I think it's, I think people can feel when you are genuinely interested in them. And so I've always had a way of trying to remember some little kind of detail. If you, if you told me in passing that you've gone on holiday or what have you, it's that interest. And I, and I do believe it comes from my passion of if I go on holiday, the one thing I want to do is people watch. Um, and so here I am, head of office. Oh, my gosh, we've only got four UK offices. And it's me, Yutunde, and I've got a group of people who are my fellow partners. There's 13 of us in the Birmingham office, and I'm all excited. And I've gone to, I've gone on holiday that Christmas to Malta to celebrate. And the day that I came back from holiday, I got a call at work from my brother in America um, to say that my mum had passed away. And this was my natural mum, my 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 foster mum passed away literally a year and a day after I got married some time ago but this was my actual mum had passed away and I was in a complete spin because obviously I'm the leader I'm not supposed to be in a spin because I know everything and I can lead everyone um, and so it was really alien because the first thing I said to a colleague is do not tell anybody my mum's died and I'm going to just sit down and carry on working and then I kind of realized, come on, Yutunde, this is not you. You can't just pretend that everything's normal. Um, and so I went back to my authentic self. Um, I, took, took, I couldn't take time out because I had a big project on, but I decided to work from home for a little while. I got the project over the line. Um, and then when I went back into the office, I decided to share what I was going through with, with people. Because one thing is... Back in the day, you have to be everything with stiff, stiff upper lip. But now it's about, as I said, being your authentic self. So I shared my journey and I shared my journey to let my colleagues know that it's OK to not be OK. Um, but it's about asking for help. Um, and so, I, you know, I shared that. And I think we it was coming up to the time, which was the National Time to Talk Day. And I said to, said to people, I'm going to be in this room at x time for a little while if you want to come and talk do and the support was absolutely beautiful because a number of people came so then i'm back from compassionate leave and we're straight into covid and so since march last year i've been trying to lead my team from from a computer screen so the birmingham office is made up of 105 people how do i show them from my my, my living room that I still care about them and so we meet on a regular basis and I get people in to talk to them to share their lockdown journeys and so we've had a number of senior partners and you know come to talk to us um, about those kind of things um, 
And then life changed again. I, I, you know, May 2020, George Floyd, I think I was blogging at the time. I'm, I'm big on LinkedIn. And I, rem I recall when I, when I became head of office, I said to them, um, do I have to stop um, posting on LinkedIn? And they said, no, which I, I thought that was amazing because I thought that I'd that they'd want to control me to an extent but I you know they, they're quite happy for me to carry on posting and blogging um one thing I didn't mention actually and I will mention it Birmingham County Court is my main court and I've practiced there for over 20 years and it's probably one of the least diverse courts in terms of black representation and then I decided that okay if it's not there I need to try and change it um, so I sought permission from my senior partner to apply to become a deputy district judge. It's a part-time role. And I got approval. I didn't think I would. I got approval. Um, and I went through the process and I was supported by a wonderful judge in Birmingham, but I wasn't successful. And I was really, really upset at the time. And I recall speaking to my senior partner when I had to say, you know, I didn't, I wasn't successful. And she said to me, don't worry, there's bigger things for you. And I really do think that's been my head of office and being given this platform to reach um, so many people. So don't be surprised by the bumps in the road. They may have been designed um, for a reason. So George Floyd and the impact of his murder. Um, obviously it was a really, really awful event, but I think it's a, an event that good can come from. And I recall at that time, um, we were doing some firm-wide talks um, about lockdown experience, and there was three of them, and I did two, and by the second one, I was hurting, and I was hurting because, for whatever reason, people in the local community, um, I don't know, decided to come to me with their, with how they were feeling, and it was weighing me down, and it was really tough, and I felt like it was down to me one to change the legal profession by 4 p.m tomorrow and I decided that I was going to back away from that a little bit but I was going to focus on what I could what I could influence and so I phoned one of our senior partners and I said to them I've got something to tell you it's not rehearsed and it's not going to be pretty but will you just listen and I poured my heart out about my life experience because as much as you see me here talking to you as your Tunde head of office, my commute on the train, you know, I, I, I can play the game that I play to myself. Will anybody sit next to me or will I be the last person to be sat next to? But if I was to stand up and say, by the way, I'm a partner at a leading law firm, I bet everybody would want to sit next to me. So I shared some of those experiences. And then I sort of kind of went, oh, what is she gonna say? And it was amazing because she said we need to work together to bring about change um, and as I said you know where I'm at is extremely diverse if we have a mantra that you can bring your whole, whole self to, to work and we really champion the diversity of each other but what's really been amazing is that I feel that the profession has listened and is listening so I've been to a number of round tables hosted by the Law Society talking about change um, and what can be done um, to drive that change. Um, and I'm really hoping that that change does come. I, you know, I'm doing what I can, which is to hold my firm to account. And we've had some of those difficult conversations and we've seen where we need to go. So we've got a race, race action plan that you know, we meet on a monthly basis. And I hope that there's a lot more people doing that. I hope that there's a lot more allies doing that for us, um, for black people, because it's not always that we're in the room and therefore we rely upon other people to um, call out the inequalities um, that are there. But it's not about just equality, it's about being included. And so my challenge to the legal profession is that I've been in it in terms of qualification for 25 years. I hope when I leave the profession in X number of years, it will be a completely 
different place in terms of the way that it looks. In the terms of the values that it holds dear um, and what is important in terms of we're not going to work people till they're completely burnt out. We are going to care for them. We're going to, you know, care about their mental health. We're going to care about their well-being because that's what I care about with, with my colleagues. I would never want to be the type of person who somebody says I had to leave because that person was just too um, too awful um, to me or the environment was just toxic. So what are my recommendations to you as you start your wonderful journeys? Think about what drives you. Think about what you're passionate about in terms of what you decide to go into because, you know, fingers crossed you'll be doing it for a long time. So I think it's really got to be something that you that you are um, really interested in. Um, try to be your authentic self. Um, I think that if you are authentic, your employer will get a lot more out of you. You will probably be more loyal um, and you will enjoy the journey. Um, so try to be your authentic self. Try not to be somebody else. Because if you have to walk over your, you know, walk through your door and you sit down and then you start being yourself in the evenings and the weekends, it probably means that the workplace is missing out on your unique X factor. Be a collector of mentors. I have so many, uh, you know, I, and they may not even know that they're mentors, but the people that I will go to with, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But if I'm really on, honest, my biggest mentor and, and is, is, is my husband. Um, and no, my husband is not a lawyer. I couldn't think of anything more boring to, than to buy, uh, marry a lawyer. Uh, my husband is actually um, a barber and he's got his own business. Um, but, you know, collect mentors because it's, it's a long road not everything's going to go well, you're going to get bumps and therefore you are going to have to draw on your resilience. And I would say about a career in the profession, in the legal profession, that if your belly doesn't burn with the desire to succeed in this profession, then I would suggest that you reconsider because there will be knockbacks, you will need resilience. Um, it's not everybody that gets everything at the first time of asking. So you need to be resilient and you need those people that when you're feeling a bit, a bit down that can go and um, inspire you to get up and go out again, whether it's in relation to writing training contract applications, whether it's you feel that you've been passed over for a promotion. And I think what I'll end on is that don't let anybody say that you cannot fly as high as you can fly. I would challenge you all just to whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. I'm still flying. I've still got places to go. You may say, but you're a partner. I've still got places to go and I will continue flying until my wings cannot fly anymore. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Yatunde. An incredibly inspiring presentation, which I think is reflected already in some of the, the very positive comments that have come in on the Q&A. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now, we have got a few minutes available for questions from the audience. So I, I will invite you all just to take a, a moment or two, if you have questions, to put them into the, the Q&A function on Zoom. And in a couple of minutes time, I'll, I'll look through the questions and, and pose a, a range of suitable questions to you Tunday. But whilst I give you a chance to do that, if I could just kick off with a question, if that's OK with you, Yatunde. Yeah. Um, it's a very relatable experience that you, that you shared, and um, particularly for students at this stage of their potential legal careers, thinking about knockbacks and resilience. And, and clearly in your days as a student, there were knockbacks and you had to take a resilient approach to, to carry on and, and progress. Could you talk a bit about where you got your resilience from? So what sort of strategies would you adopt at that time to keep on going and push through to the next stage? I think it was really around um, talking to people. So that mentorship, 
you know, tomorrow is always a new day um, and who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So it, it was a case of just talking to people, um, being self-critical um, and, you know, standing back with a different lens and did I really put enough energy into that application? Did I really take, undertake the research that I should have done? Or did I just go on the internet, look at who the senior partner was, take off, you know, replace their name with the previous letter and just send it across? Um, so I think I would say be kind to yourselves because you will have people, you know, in my day, I had people who were at law school and I could tell you a funny story. Um, when I joined, when I, no, at law school, there was a guy that had already got a training contract. When I joined um, McGrath & Co, that guy happened to be, he happened to be in a firm underneath, uh, that was located underneath McGrath & Co in this, in this block. Um, and it so happened that that person was one of the people that interviewed me when I went to try, uh, when I went to uh, Shoesmith. So it's interesting how things work out. Things will, people's careers will go in different, different guises, but you know the, the story about the tortoise and the hare, you will get there, but it may mean that you just need to be a little bit resilient. Thank you, some really useful insights there. Uh, we've had a couple of, Good, really good questions come through. So I'm, I'm going to start off with a question about Trowers specifically and the position of um, students who might be applying for training contracts. So, so the question that's come is, in is considering your personal journey, how is Trowers bridging the gap for students or graduates with lower academic performance or not so impressive records? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's something that we're looking at at the moment. So there's a, a lot of discussion about the whole, um, what grades that you require people to have and what universities that you require them to come, come from. And, you know, law is so competitive. And, you know, I, I speak to young people and I say, you know, put off having a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, whoever. Um, and just focus on getting a first. But there are so many people out there with first, and we're realizing that we're missing out on talent. So, I so what we're looking at is we're looking at our conceptualized um, recruitment. So that means taking some of the information off um, the CV and not providing that to interviewers um, at the time. Um, we we obviously do our summer vacation scheme, and again. We're, we're using that kind of approach in relation to our summer back placements because we want what it is is about talented people um yesterday you may know it was international women's day and we had a talk at work um, from one of our senior equity partners and her story was just so compelling and this is a woman who's come from um, a council estate um went into was a chef had no grades and the next minute, she is the highest that you can get in my, my firm. So we definitely understand di diversity and difference and underrepresentation. Um, so we are looking at ourselves so that we are, that we can attract a wider pool of people. Thank you very much. And a, and a linked question actually from one of our American students who's um, raised a question, a very interesting question around affirmative action. So if I, if I just read out some, some key points for the audience, um, an aunt our student recognises that firms and employers in general are starting to implement diversity targets for recruitment and promotion. Um, and, and obviously as an American who's conscious of the debate around affirmative action and, and is aware of the animosities that, that that can sometimes give rise to. So, so I, I wondered, Yutande, what are your thoughts on these policies and, and what else do you think needs to happen? Yeah, it's really interesting. And I grapple with that and targets, if I'm honest, because targets are easy. There you go. I've got, you know, five people of colour. I've ticked all of those boxes. I won't, I won't put anything into them and therefore they'll just stay there and they'll leave eventually. So affirmative action, I'm not sure if it works. I think it's a cultural shift. It has to be a commitment. And I think if organizations are, are, and firms are willing to have that conversation, what they need to get is their data because the data, you may have people of color and um, people from other representative groups, but your data will tell you whether or not you value them. 
So the data will say, do, do you give them the type of work that will enable them to get the experience to go for promotion? Do you mentor them? Do you support them? So affirmative action, yeah, fine for tech, tick box, but I think what's needed is a cultural change uh, for people to be, for organisations to be committed to um, all people, all, but yeah, all people, underrepresented people in particular. Thank you. Um, for those watching, you still have a few more minutes to input your questions if, you, if you'd like to. Um, whilst we just wait to see if any more questions come through, I, I had a question yesterday specifically about your role as head of office. Um, I think those of us outside current legal practice hear a lot about roles like partner, head of office and so on. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about what sort of things the head of office role actually involves for you? Yeah, so the head of office, I, you know, when I got the role, I was like, so what do I do with it? And I was told it was a blank piece of paper. So my previous head of office um, was a very busy bee out and about and profiling. And I think profiling is important. And what I mean by profiling is going out to the local uh, market, business market, and talking to people, telling people what we do and so on. But I've got other partners that can do that. I don't see why I need to do that for them. And I think my appointment was a, a good time because I feel for me, it's yes, it's an outward, outward facing um, uh, position, but very much it's, for me, it's about the well-being of my colleagues and making sure that everybody's OK. And I think that's really relevant with COVID coming along. And, and so it can change. It, it could be something else when we get back into um, into um, the office. Um, so I also engage in meetings with um, sort of the heads of section and the other heads of office. So we talk about strategy. So during lockdown, um, we were having sort of bi-weekly meetings. And I can honestly say my first one, I was absolutely petrified that, wow, I'm going into this meeting with all these heads of section. Um, but it's, you know, making sure that we've got, you know, enough work, um, you know, making sure that people are billing. Obviously, it's all about um, making money at the end of the day. Um, but my, my best asset is about the people. So if people are having a, a tough time, and, and so obviously a lot of people have during lockdown, I've been trying to just pour some, pour some of your Tunde's love into them and make them feel good about themselves. Um, but partners generally, gosh, there are so many different levels in a partnership. Um, so you can have what's known as a salaried partner who is a person that's employed, and then you can get equity partners that basically take drawings and share in the profits. And then even on the partnership ladder, there are so many different levels of partnership, but it just depends on how the partnership um, is is set up but basically generally the equity partners are the actual owners of the business um, they will put money into the business so they'll put some capital in um, and they will the, be the ones that make the day-to-day -day decisions about the direction um, that the firm is going in thank you very much Yatunde. we'll just have a couple more questions um had a question come through from Lisa Webley, who's the head of Birmingham Law School. So um, I'll, I'll read out Lisa's question. Um, Lisa says, thank you for the fabulous talk, and um, which was inspirational. Um, Lisa wonders, what was the most important thing you've learnt along the way from any mistakes you may have made as a leader? We all make mistakes, and one of the good things to come out of them is the opportunity to grow. What lesson, if any, do you want us to learn from you? What bad leadership is? I, I, that, that's my biggest thing. I've seen bad lead, leadership. Um, I talked earlier about respect. I don't, I, nobody has the right to trample on another person's confidence for any reason. I'm, I'm, I, I operate a very flat structure. I'm not hierarchical at all. I, yeah, that doesn't mean that I won't make a decision because I will make a decision, but I, I'm, I'm a person that likes to involve people. Um, and so I'm sure I have made bad decisions um, in the past. Um, I can't think of one at the moment. I'm sorry, Lisa. But I do think it's bad. I think it is. I, I, think, I think what's resonated with me is I know what bad leadership looks like. And I, I would never, ever want anybody to turn around and say, 
that I treated them in a way that was anything but respectful, even if we part ways, even if we part ways. And as I said, I'm a collector of people. So a lot of people that have come and gone through my team um, have been, have gone because they've gone on to better things. They say that people leave poor leaders. Um, and I would say that hopefully nobody's left me because I've been a poor leader. And that's a testament to my, the strength of my leadership. Thank you, Yatunde. And linking to that question around leadership, we, we've had a question from one of the, the students about any recommendations you have for law students who are interested in leadership and are looking to develop their leadership skills at this stage of their academic careers. Yeah, I think um, I was talking about this earlier. The fact is that we're all leaders. The fact that I've got a badge that says I'm a partner, I'm a head of office. And leadership is, I guess, in, about, it, it's in a way about influence. Um, and the way in which you can bring people with you. And so, you know, there will be people um, who would love to be in your position. They'd love to be at university. They'd love to be at the University of Birmingham. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's I guess, a, a way about, a, a way of how do you influence those people? Would you like to go back into schools and give a talk about your experience today? Um, um, there's loads of books. There's loads of books out there and self-help books that you can you can read about leadership. Um, but you can just ask people, you know, ask Paul, what's it like to be in your position, in your leadership position? You're always very welcome to ask me. Um, another really good question that's come through is um, what accomplishment is most important to you of all the things you've achieved in your career, Yatunde? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult one. I think possibly it would have to be actually qualifying in 1996, because that was the thing that I was told that I couldn't do. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's that one. I think. I think it's becoming head of office. There are so many, but, but they're all different for different reasons. Um, but I think the one that really was the sweet spot was actually qualifying because I was told that I couldn't. So everything since that date has been the icing on the cake because see, this, this is, you know, this is a place that I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be here giving this talk because I was told that I couldn't do it. Thank you. Um, an interesting question that's come through, um, again, about um, the recruitment side of things mm -hmm. and um, progression being tied to not just work output, but to personality and rapport, and the fact that sometimes minority, international, or socioeconomically disadvantaged candidates can lack some of the um, common experiences that can help in building up those workplace relationships. Do you have any thoughts on what, what law firms like Trowers can do to help to address those gaps and issues? Yeah, I think this comes back down to the appreciation of diversity. Um, so, you know, we talk about those um, let's Friday nights going down the pub. That used to be a thing um, many years ago for, for me. But now I recognise that I work in a, an environment where there's people that don't drink for religious reasons, for personal reasons. Um, and it's about thinking about those things to make the workplace inclusive. So, for example, with my team, Christmas, we went to a halal restaurant and somebody said, I'm so glad that we're here because it means that I can have anything off the, the menu. It's about including people. Um, and I think that's the thing that I think law firms are grappling with at the moment in terms of how to bring about those changes. And I think as part of that process, we as in underrepresented people need to share some of our journey, you know, um, and talk about some of our experiences and invite people into our world share a little bit so at Trowers we've got since lockdown we've got a um I think it's a fortnightly or three weekly magazine called Trowers Includes and we've got representation from different networks you know our our um our diversity um initiative is called Trowers Includes and it was uh, it reflects all of the protected characteristics and so we invite people to write a piece about their experiences we, you know, it's about learning from each other, but then once you've learned from each other, it's about respecting those differences. Um, and I think it makes us better people because it's not only in the workplace do we 
you know, are we able to be allies and, and champion people? It then obviously filters into our personal lives. And I think as a result of embracing diversity and including, including people, we create a much better environment for people to thrive in. Thank you, Sunday. And being conscious of the time, if, if I could just ask one last question before we conclude. Um, thinking about everything that we've heard today, I wondered if you could give us your one top piece of advice for aspiring lawyers who are sitting watching this Leaders in Law lecture. So based on all, your, all of your experiences, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give as a takeaway? Don't let anybody tell you that you can't. I think that has to be it. I think you know, it, it is that and it's resilience. It's two things. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> but it is, it's literally that don't, don't let people tell you that you can't, you may have to go, you may have to look at a different journey. So you may not go A, B, C, D, you may go, you know, a different route, but you will get there. But it's about having that resilience and that desire. Thank you very much. So fantastic and very inspirational and advice. And, and as we draw the session towards a close, I, I thought um, a, a good way to, to bring us towards that conclusion would just be to draw on one of the comments that's come in from actually one of our graduates who I can see is um, watching the session in Canada right now. So, hello, Alyssa, nice to see you. And um, Alyssa's comment is, Yutunde, thank you for never giving up and being such an inspiration. Um, you literally encourage me all the way in Canada right now. And I think that, all of us watching would feel the same, very inspired by your achievements and the positive approach that you've you've taken and, and everything that you've achieved in your career. So thank you ever so much on behalf of Kepler, Birmingham Law School and the students for, for coming along on Zoom this evening to speak with us and, and share these insights, which really have been invaluable. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been, I, I feel so privileged and I wish you all the very best for the future please do keep safe safe and well and i hope to be able to see you in person very soon i'm looking forward to that as well hopefully next academic year brilliant thank you very much everyone for joining us and thank you for your sunday